Mm, nice and cool here. Keeps you awake, yeah. Hey folks, how's everybody doing? Hello? Hello? Hey interwebs. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, everyone, get ready. Uh, for those of you watching online or listening on Intune, please get your questions in the queue. It's hashtag FMC12. Jean's last presentation certainly was very relevant in light of earlier discussions on collective licensing and collective bargaining. And this conversation, too, is very relevant on some of the free speech issues that cropped up earlier with Senator Wyden. Um, one of my absolute favorite things about the Future of Music Coalition is our ability to be nimble in our programming and to be able to present conversations with really intelligent people that address issues often before they really hit the general public. Um, in, and, and certainly the academic community in the broadest sense. Uh, Future Music Coalition is pleased to present this groundbreaking panel and the first of its kind, and it's only the beginning of many more and for many years to follow. So here's why Pussy Riot matters. Music is a vehicle for expression and oftentimes throughout history that expression has taken the form of protest. Take for example the case of Pussy Riot, the Russian punk band that grabbed headlines around the world following a 45 second performance in the Temple of Christ the Savior in Moscow. Whoops, maybe Christ is saying something. When members of the Pussy Riot Collective were imprisoned and later sentenced to two years in a labor colony, other artists, specifically and namely musicians, including Bjork, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Paul McCartney, Madonna, Yoko Ono, just to name a few, rallied to their defense. This case brings up a lot of issues, in particular free speech, human rights, feminism, and confrontational art in a networked world. So here to help us think through the implications is an amazing panel, including Molly Newman, Vice President of Label Relations for eMusic, who's joining us from New York. Dr. Mark Yaffe, author of Rock and Roll and Nationalism, curator of the International Counterculture Archive at George Washington University. Musician Blue S. Moon. Artist, writer, activist Amy Klein and our moderator, Lindsay Zolads, who's a freelance writer and Pitchfork contributing editor. So ladies and gentlemen, here's why Pussy Riot matters. Thank you. Um, and like Lissa said, I'm so excited that this is the first panel of its kind on Pussy Riot, and I think we're all um, honored to be a part of it. Uh, you did a good job of sort of introducing why this issue um, matters to the future of music, so I don't want to waste any more time with the context um, because I think we have some really fascinating perspectives to share. Um, and I was thinking earlier, I was listening to Thomas Frank's remarks about, he kept using this phrase, adversarial art, which I think is something that's so rare um, in global culture these days, and I think something about the Pussy Riot protests that resonated so much in the West was it was this perfect example of adversarial art and what that looks like in 2012. Um, so I'm excited to keep talking about that um, with this panel. So I want to first um, field a question to you, Mark, because you've done a lot of really fascinating work on looking at Russian countercultures um, in the past couple decades, but particularly post-Soviet. Um, so if you could maybe, first of all, put this into context a little bit, and um, you know, the, the charges against Pussy Riot were hooliganism uh, based on religious hatred. And hooliganism in Russia carries a very um, historic context. So if you could maybe speak a little bit about that and, and put this into context a bit for us. Um, yes, um, well, it will take uh, f probably uh, many years to sort out what really happened and what uh, Pussy Riot really is. Uh, is it a, a punk band? Uh, uh, is it an art collective or is it a boat or it's neither? Uh, but uh, uh, the resonance of their 45 second uh, uh, performance at the um, Temple of Christ the Savior uh, is uh, uh, tremendous uh, inside of Russia and uh, outside, well, um, as far as uh, United States. Uh, and um, but uh, Pussy Riot doesn't uh, happen to, uh, um, out of the blue, uh, but comes uh, out of, uh, um, well, actually, historically, anthropologically speaking, f from uh, ancient Russian uh, 
um, uh, tradition of uh, um, religious hooliganism uh, that is known uh, as Russian or Byzantine tradition of uh, holy fools. Uh, that is uh, someone uh, who uh, takes upon oneself uh, um, uh, the uh, persona of a um, uh, fool, uh, fool of uh, Christ, um, or a village idiot, uh, and uh, through uh, uh, and, and and from th that uh, position uh, speaks truth uh, uh, to to power. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, historical elements that Pussy Riot uh, uh, members are were, were, were very much aware of was uh, usage of uh, uh, absurdist, uh, obscene uh, hu hooligan um, and and uh, um, uh, satirical, uh, parodic, ironic um, 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 idioms uh, in, 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 the, in their uh, action. So uh, Pussy Riot is, uh, in Russian mind, uh, Pussy Riot is uh, inseparable from uh, the satirical, uh, humorous tradition of uh, uh, Russian counterculture, from, from, from which uh, they gr grew out from. What is new about them uh, uh, is not even their humor, because uh, this kind of humor um, is known in, in, uh, in the history of Russian counterculture, but, but uh, what is new about them uh, is uh, the generational thing and the gender thing, because until Pussy Riot, uh, uh, Russian counterculture, counter which is uh, uh, old and um, uh, venerable and, uh, um, and has done uh, many heroic things, uh, was entirely uh, male-dominated. Uh, and then so something happened in this century uh, with the uh, people of uh, Pussy Riot's generation, that is the ones that uh, grew, grew uh, uh, and formed after the um, uh, Soviet Union. Uh, something happened, uh, something that harkens back to 20 years, probably back to uh, the traditions of um, American feminist uh, uh, rock, uh, punk rock. Um, and I think, I think that's a good segue to, I want to bring Molly Newman into the conversation too, um, who was a sort of founding member of the Riot Girl movement with her band Bratmobile back in the early 90s. And um, in addition to, I think it was sort of lost on Western audiences that Pussy Riot were riffing on this idea of the holy fool and a history of absurdism and humor in Russian satire, but the, the signifiers that really translated over here was that they were calling upon the imagery of the Riot Girl movement. Um, so I want to talk to Molly a little bit about that. And so Molly, I know you can, I can't see you, but I know you can hear us. Are you, are you <laughs> alive up me? there? <laughs> um, I want to ask sort of a two-part question of you. Um, what was it like when this case first came to your attention? And, you know, these women in interviews were citing the Riot Girl movement as a source of inspiration in this work that you've done about 20 years ago now, what, what did it feel like to sort of see that enlivened in this new context? And also, what are the differences, both cultural and in the way that media is used by each of these radical collectives? Um, if you could just speak to that. So the first part, and you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, um, the first part, I mean, it felt uh, certainly, I, I mean, I don't know if flattering is, is the right word necessarily, but certainly gratifying. Um, but also, I mean, at the same time, what was happening to them was certainly um, shocking. And, you know, uh, I think Mark hopefully will speak a little bit to, you know, ag again, to, you know, the context of how this is um, happening within Russian and Russian culture where, and the Western view of, of how it was perceived, I think, Sometimes we had to, uh, you know, keep ourselves in check a little bit because our values and um, assumptions about freedom and liberty and, and what's available to us as humans is, you know, perhaps there's a, there's a different uh, construct. So I, I tried to, you know, look at what they were doing uh, for what it was and how brave it was um, and uh, certainly felt, you know, in thinking back in context and um, in comparison to the work that we did in starting our bands and the messages that we were talking about 
you know, uh, we never were necessarily concerned with going to jail for how we were, um, for, for the things that we were saying. And the fact that they almost knew that they would be put in jail, um, that they were taking that risk was something that I think, uh, you know, caused me to reflect quite a bit. Thanks. And yeah, I, I think that another aspect of this that is so interesting, and Amy, maybe you can speak to this. Um, Amy's done a lot of organizing as the founding, a founding member of the Permanent Wave Feminist Collective. So you're sort of bringing um, the current state of DIY and grassroots feminist organizing and the impact that this had on Pussy Riot, um, or that Pussy Riot had in that context. Um, so maybe if you could just speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I want to talk um, in a kind of personal way about my experiences um, organizing and working with others to organize actions in support of Pussy Riot. Um, I'm a member of Permanent Wave, which is a series of um, linked feminist collectives that focus on um, encouraging women to participate and collaborate in activism and the arts. Um, so in the New York City group, we received a message from um, a member of Pussy Riot's international legal defense team, which is um, a man who was in communication um, with Pussy Riot's lawyers. And he reached out to our group and was like, you guys are um, a feminist collective focusing on women in the arts and punk rock. Can you do something in the United States to support Pussy Riot? Um, so what we thought to do initially was to have benefit shows. Um, we actually, um, the first benefit show featured Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys. Um, which was a huge deal. It was the most high profile thing that <laughs> I've ever done um, or that I've ever been involved in. And it definitely was for the group. Um, and so the benefit show for Pussy Riot featuring Ad Rock um, generated a lot of media attention. Um, it was the first time that the case was mentioned in The Guardian. Um, and the benefit show led to the case of Pussy Riot being mentioned in Rolling Stone and Spin and magazines like this. Um, so it really got a fair amount of media attention. Um, there were other less high profile um, benefit shows that we did after and the Permanent Wave Boston did one. Um, um, so yeah, it was really interesting. Um, the, the effect um, that people seem to, you know, have the effect that the case had on women my age where, I mean, we heard as a group, Pussy Riot, you know, needs help and immediately people mobilized to help them. That was really an interesting experience. Um, people felt like this was something we could come together about. Um, after the Pussy Riot case, actually, um, the the concepts that we've been thinking about um, led to a lot of discussion and um, introspection among members of the group. Um, I think one of the things that came to our attention was like how, in what ways this case was similar and different to um, issues of feminism at home. Um, people, I think, um, thought it was important, and yeah, as a group, we thought it was important to talk about um, people who are incarcerated in the United States um, wrongfully. And um, around the same time that the Pussy Riot case was happening, um, a transgender woman of color named uh, Cece McDonald was also. Um, wrongfully incarcerated. Um, this was a situation in which um, a transgender woman was defending herself against a hate crime and um, was imprisoned for murder um, for two years, which is the same length of time that Pussy Riot got. So 
one of the things that we started thinking about um, as a group of feminists was like what kinds of issues um, get major media attention and when people are incarcerated, you know, what stories of incarceration are played up and which ones are sometimes overlooked. I mean, overall, this was, in a personal way, um, I think an important moment where um, a lot of young feminists realized um, like the importance of race um, within feminism, um, the importance of respecting and um, paying attention to um, differences that exist in America, um, and how things don't necessarily translate directly from Russia to America in the same context. So, I mean, after having done something very public as kind of activism that was public with these benefit shows, a lot of feminism that I'm doing now and I think other members of the group are doing now has to do with more um, introspective consciousness raising and discussion, which I think is uh, equally important that, you know, that there are big moments where people put on public displays, but then there's also a lot of thinking and um, work that needs to go on if we want to like move feminism forward. Um, I think like one of the things that you could see as a weakness of um, punk rock feminism as it's been viewed by our society um, or as people tend to think of it is that people see punk rock feminism as like something that focuses on the experiences of white women. Um, and I think that needs to change if uh, we are gonna continue to work with punk rock feminism and if it's gonna be a useful or valuable thing to work with here in America in the future. Yeah, and I, you brought up a ton of good points there, but I wanna sort of zero in on one that you mentioned a while ago that, you know, I think something that we saw reported on in this case too is that there was such a disparity between the way that this case was perceived in the West and the way that a lot of, like you mentioned, Ad Rock, for example, coming out and vocalizing his support. There were so many celebrities in American culture and in Western culture who were, you know, Madonna um, wrote Free Pussy Riot on her back at a concert and that was a very iconic image here, but that was so different from the way that this case was perceived in Russia. So you know, there becomes a question of how do we reconcile this? How do you consciously support this, um, you know, in a country where I can stand up here at this podium and say pussy to y'all, like that's free speech and that is great. But how, you know, I think it, it brought up a lot of questions like you were saying of how we can um, support this in a way that keeps our privilege in check. So you know, open question to anybody, but Mark, this might be something that you can speak to of just the disparity between um, how this case was perceived in the West and what, to your knowledge, how, what do people in Russia actually think about Pussy Riot? Uh, well, the whole notion of um, uh, reception and perception of uh, Pussy Riot both in Russia and in the West kind of bewilders me because, because uh, of what happened uh, uh, in terms of reception uh, and perception uh, here um, didn't follow any any expected patterns. Uh, for instance, uh, Russian uh, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Russian artistic community, uh, there was an immediate uh, schism uh, between. Uh, uh, some uh, um, avant-garde uh, and uh, performance art um, and uh, uh, rock uh, mu musicians who uh, 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 so supported uh, Pussy Riot uh, uh, vehemently uh, uh, to a great extent, uh, to, uh, endangering themselves. Uh, the same uh, goes to a number of uh, prominent uh, artists, writers, uh, and journalists, and 
film directors uh, in Russia. Uh, and then there was a, 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 a huge number of intelligentsia that uh, uh, displayed nothing but uh, uh, misunderstanding and uh, hatred of uh, Pussy Riot, uh, uh, phrasing it uh, not, necessar not necessarily uh, uh, the, the way uh, Putinistas did, that they have to be punished uh, with, with, with a um, um, jail term, but at least they have to be taken outside and uh, have their pants uh, taken down and publicly whipped or uh, uh, there was a, a lot of talk of physical punishment, even metaphorically, uh, which uh, I uh, um, and uh, many of uh, my colleagues find, uh, find absolutely uh, disgusting. Uh, and there was uh, this almost uh, sadistic, voyeuristic element, like this, this uh, um, this um, uh, young women have to be physically, publicly uh, punished. Uh, when you whip someone, you undress them. So there was this voyeuristic desire. Uh, then there was, of course, the simple folk in the street uh, that were very divided. Babushkas, the ones who, uh, whose uh, religious uh, uh, religious perception could, could have been... Uh, 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 for real, um, um, uh, offended uh, by Pussy Riot, forgave them. Uh, but the, 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 there was a, a lots of, uh, nevertheless, uh, um, a public demagoguery about how offensive uh, to religious spirit uh, that uh, uh, performance was. To which, uh, to my astonishment, I just found out today, um, uh, 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 American um, 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 uh, feminist uh, uh, establishment uh, per personified uh, to some degree by Camille Paglia uh, signed up to entirely uh, 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 speaking absurdities about uh, how she empathizes with Russian believers uh, that were offended by, by, by Pussy Riot. Excuse me, Camille. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know on what planet uh, you exist. Uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, 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 what happened in the West? Uh, it, it, it also kind of flubbed flabbergasting, uh, because there's no rhyme or reason uh, uh, except for um, the, 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 the um, uh, feminist uh, punk community uh, who, whom uh, uh, we expected uh, uh, to, to come to uh, the uh, Pussy Riot defense. Uh, I mean, the, the, there is Madonna, there is Sting, and uh, then the, the, there are um, um, wild male philosophers like Bernard Levy and Slavoj Žižek, uh, and and then again, the, um, uh, Naomi Wolf and Camille Paglia are, are uh, kind of absent. Uh, uh, so, um, I mean, it, 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 it is very strange how Pussy Riot touch people and on, on, on what levels and what... But uh, very many, uh, both in the West uh, and in Russia, uh, very many complained about Pussy Riot's lack of artistic uh, value. Um, uh, in their music. Well, if that was a good music, I would support them. But since this is this garbage, uh, homemade uh, DIY punk, I cannot support it, and I cannot uh, uh, lend my uh, honorable name to uh, the, to the cause. Insane. But luckily, we Americans have a lot of experience with sloppy DIY punk and have <laughs> <laughs> a sort of a, a grassroots infrastructure now of, of people... Um, you know, who will kind of come around a cause like this. And Blue, I know you've done some activist work um, related to this as well, because, you know, Mark, you were speaking about more of the mainstream feminist and mainstream intelligentsia, uh, even in America, not really um, coalescing around this issue. But I think that there was, as Amy was speaking to, a huge, um, just a groundswell of, of feminist uh, support for this issue from and a lot from younger women too so if you could maybe speak to that blue and like what how you see this sort of impacting a future generation of activists and feminists um i think that this was quite interesting to uh find out about and learn more about especially and i think for the younger generation or even you know my generation um just noticing how this was like a moment of 
you know, women showing that they can be brave and stand up for whatever they believe in, no matter what the consequences are, even if it's to, you know, go to prison or whatever, they still, they still, you know, got to have a voice and do something about it. And, um, you know, that's, I, I also volunteer for Girls Rock, and I think that's one of the things that we also teach within Girls Rock. And, you know, this is a camp for girls from the age of 8 to 18, and, you know, they learn a ton of things, but one of the main things that they learn is to be proud of who they are and that they have a voice and everyone deserves to hear it, no matter what. So I think even seeing this, it's also just another example is, you know, despite what may come from what you're doing, if you believe in what you're doing and it means enough to you, then you have, you, you know, you can make people listen to you by any means necessary. You know what I mean? And in this particular instance, there was no violence that you know, no one was hurt or anything. It's just them saying, listen, we matter. This is what we want heard and this is what we're going to do and I think that within itself is you know beyond powerful you know it's like this is what I'm going to do and if this is the consequences that's fine too I'm not going to be hushed I'm not going to be ignored and you know I matter so mm -hmm. I think that's great you know <laughs> so <my Yeah>. going. <laughs> and and so much of you know a huge factor obviously in this story is the role that the internet played and you know we've been talking all day about these shifting ideas of music in the digital age and, and new emerging platforms and this is you know a central component to this story and I think it's really something that we can look to to see the ways that that the internet really can be used for social change in a way that people had not really seen before um, so and, and I we were discussing this earlier, but I've I've been really fascinated um, to read things about the role that memes played in this current election, and I, that I read something that said this was the first meme election, um, which I think is so true. You saw the binders full of women and the big bird out of Mitt Romney's mouth, like all of that sort of again coalescing into this um, internet phenomenon. But in a way, I think Pussy Riot were a meme too. Um, and I mean that in a good and a bad way, and that they were able to tap into this very visual, visceral um, image and transmit that. But you know, I think we also um, see now that the benefits that you get of being a meme is that a lot of people will pay attention uh, for a very short amount of time, and then there is sort of a crest of that wave. Um, so I want to, and this is open to anybody who wants to jump on this, but. Um, you know, what What can we learn about the good and the bad of using social media and digital platforms to kind of get this sort of a message across? I saw you like opening your mouth, Amy, so I don't know if you, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. Uh, okay, I mean, one thing that is interesting about Pussy Riot um, is that visually, I mean, they had a complete like a complete package with the music, the message, the, and the costumes that made them so um, shareable and like a, a musical level. Yeah, right? They, they were, for those who don't know, they wear a uh, full balaclava, so you can't tell who they are. Um, and they wear bright colored um, clothing. Um, but the point is like their identities are pretty obscure. Um, and it was a big deal when certain members were found and revealed. Anyway, I think like the mask element was very interesting um, because part of the point was that anyone could put on the mask and anyone could be Pussy Riot, and they were talking about that a lot in their messaging. You are all Pussy Riot. You know, we are all Pussy Riot became something. Um, and, and there's a little bit like the social media aspect of it where anybody could share Pussy Riot and there were people putting on the mask and taking a photo and uploading it, the photo of themselves. And then all of a sudden there were pictures of Pussy Rioters all over the world and all over the internet. So I mean, that's a real um, meme situation. And it was interesting. I mean, that's a very like Occupy era kind of philosophy, like there's no leader, you can do this too, anybody's a part of the movement. Um, 
it's a very social media kind of 21st century way of branding and, and messaging. And it was very effective. Um, like in terms of the organizing work that I did, there was an older woman who was interested in um, organizing around um, women's right to contraception um, this summer when there was a lot of really damaging rhetoric about women in the presidential election and every other thing out of somebody's mouth was, you know, what's legitimate rape or something about women don't deserve birth control. So, I mean, people were really mad. And so I met an older woman who was saying, um, why, do, why don't younger women wear pussy riot masks and start having pussy riots about the issues that matter to us in America, like birth control and, um, and you know, our rights? Because, I mean, it was, I think this summer was a particular time when young women felt, you know, Planned Parenthood as being is being um, cut and the rights we took for granted are taken away. There was a lot of anger and Pussy Riot tapped into that sentiment. And because it was something that anyone could do conceivably, you know, all you needed to cut some eye holes out of a hat and you got a balaclava, it, it was very interesting. Of course, the downside of a meme, right, is that, I mean, once you hit mainstream media and you're on the front page of a lot of publications, then it becomes a trend and it's not really a social movement anymore. It's the hot button issue and then after a while it's replaced by the next trend. So I mean, now most people are not talking about Pussy Riot, even though I mean, Pussy Riot members are still in jail. So, Although we're yeah. talking about it We're talking about it now. now. That's true. Which, yeah. Because I, I, if I could just yeah. <laughs> interject, um, I, I think it's the same media cycle that we're, I don't think that the internet necessarily, you know, makes those conversations more superficial or shallow or anything like that. I think it just speeds that cycle up. You know, I think that any interest or any case like this and story like this, people, the interests crest and it always has. And that's, that's always the way that the media has worked. But, you know, it comes in these flashes now. And I think that, um, that is the big difference. And, it makes me wonder, and this, Molly might be able to speak to this particularly, but anyone um, who wants to jump in, you know, is how, how do we kind of get beyond, like, how do we tap into that really visceral flash of, you know, energy that, like you were saying, Amy, that I think a lot of young feminists felt over the summer, um, but now that, you know, we're kind of in this post-election, I think, like, a lot of women are feeling pretty good about the way <laughs> things went. Um, how how do we kind of tap into that and not fall into complacency? And what might this story tell us about how to do that? Oh, Molly, if you <laughs> not to put you well, on the spot now. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I have a, a nice clean answer necessarily um, to, to the question. I mean, I think, because I think it's a, a big expectation to, to, you know, have for any one, um, you know, situation to sort of invigorate or reinvigorate, you know, one thing to, with, with a, a you know, a, I guess, like I said, a clear expectation of it. But I think that it has generated enough conversation around, the uh, the term feminism and the idea of young women um, in mass culture again having being you know seeing calling themselves feminists and and the 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 energy that they've been able to generate I think is something that um, you know obviously there are many women in many parts of arts and creativity making music and um, you know, Blue mentioned the, the girls rock, girl rock camps. I mean, those are some things that are, you know, tremendously exciting to someone who, you know, 25 years ago could only have dreamed of having something along those lines. I mean, it was actually unfathomable. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that this sort of energy and reintroduction into a, a wider conversation of, you know, feminist acceptance um, and energy associated with music is something that hopefully there's a way for that to to res resonate and continue on. I just don't know necessarily about what you should what we should expect of it necessarily because I think I've always believed personally that any action 
and any creativity and any sort of momentum can is something positive. And you know, 20 years after I started my band, that I'm still, for some reason, you know, my my opinion now is is um, still requested on topics like this is something that I wouldn't have imagined then either. But that's been my personal philosophy: is to keep making work, keep doing what you can, and still and remain connected, and then hopefully that will transcend and continue to inspire and generate more energy and momentum. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> a tall of, order. It was a vague, somewhat relevantly. <laughs> sort of utopian um, request <laughs> there. But we're actually going to move to questions now because I want to make sure we have time for that. Any questions? Nobody wants to say the word pussy into the mic. <laughs> I thought that was going to be like the galvanizing force here. A lot of people um, have liked saying that, though, that you can yeah. certainly tell. Yeah, I think we have a question up here. Um, I just wanted to know, like, um, when what was the what the whole purpose behind Pussy Riot and their movement? Yes. Could you the repeat US. the question? I'm sorry. I just want to know um, the whole movement behind Pussy Riot um, here in the U.S. and also in Russia. So just, I, yeah, quick. Uh, well, uh, let me just uh, say a few words uh, where they came from uh, in Russia. Uh, uh, back in uh, 2008, uh, they, they started both in Moscow and in uh, 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 St. Petersburg, uh, an art uh, collective of uh, guerrilla artists uh, engaged in extreme uh, um, uh, uh, public art uh, uh, called uh, uh, Vaina, that means the war. Uh, well, I mean, the, the name itself uh, itself speaks for, for itself. Uh, it w uh, and uh, they, 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 they started with the bank, literally, with uh, uh, an orgy uh, uh, that uh, occurred at the um, uh, museum of uh, uh, zoological museum of Moscow State University celebrating um, uh, President Medvedev's coming to power in 2008. Um, well, after that, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, two of the Pussy Riot uh, members uh, uh, were the founding members of that art collective. Uh, but these two founding members were uh, more most radical ones, that the ones that uh, agreed uh, to go to jail, and therefore they split, splintered from the from their uh, uh, mother group. Um, that's the that's the history. If I can make a really quick comment, too, that um, something you had mentioned, because I, I think looking at this in terms of the internet cycle doesn't tell the whole story here because, you know, as we said, this is the first panel where this is happening. And Mark, something you had mentioned earlier um, in the green room that I thought was interesting is that, you know, it's sort of moving through this phase where if once the mainstream media gets tired of the story or doesn't see a new angle to report on anymore, this is moving sort of to the academic realm now. Um, and I think you mentioned that there, you're going to, I think, a Slavic studies yeah. conference where there's also going to be a whole panel on Pussy Riot. And you said this will spawn many, many a dissertation <laughs> um, for many years to come. So again, I think that this conversation still has a lot of life in it, even if, you know, it's not a trending topic on Twitter anymore. Um, I don't think the conversation is over here. So, any more questions out there? Uh, I guess I'm curious about the the more general sort of counterculture and unrest happening in Russia which started with the sort of idea that the election was thrown and went through sort of public outcry and that sort of stuff. And then uh, at one point was took the form of little dolls as protest and then to, to Pussy Riot. And I'm wondering if there's a, a fatigue maybe, like that they just have gotten tired of getting arrested maybe. Um, 
Well, um, uh, in, in regards to uh, uh, Russian uh, 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 protest movement uh, in general, outside of uh, guerrilla artists such as Vaina and Pussy Riot, uh, the, 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 the movement as such is pathetic. It's, it's laughable. Uh, it consists mostly of, of uh, uh, overeducated, overpaid urbanites. Uh, um, and, uh, I mean, they can't gather a, a crowd uh, larger than 30,000 yuppies uh, uh, in downtown Moscow. Uh, and it uh, usually looks uh, like a f f f f fashion show. Uh, so... Uh, f we can't seriously speak uh, uh, yet about uh, 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 so, 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 so social movement per se. There is no uh, reputable, uh, sizable uh, uh, parties that are con contesting. There is no uh, organizations uh, uh, of, 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 of any sort that re 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 represent dissent. Uh, it is left to... Uh, Russia's youth, the, the 22 year old ones, to uh, decide this problem. Because they are the ones who grew up, grew, grew up without uh, Soviet indoctrination. They are absolutely free people, like Pus the, the way Pussy Riot have proved it. Uh, they are not brainwashed. Uh, they are fresh, they are smart, they are extremely well educated, and they are extremely knowledgeable about media and uh, uh, social media in particular. I mean, Pussy Riot would not exist if they did not uh, have in mind social media. They, they created themselves for social media. Um, so, it, it is all in the future. It's a, hopeful, it's a hopeful note to end on, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you so much. This is a really exciting discussion to have. In. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.